Thank you all for joining us. Appreciate it. This is the 2021 Green Button Alliance Annual General Meeting. It is a pleasure to have you here, and we're excited that uh, you can come join us, uh, members and non-members. We, uh, we like to share what's going on uh, in the community, what we've been up to for the year, what we're planning to do in the coming year, and um, uh, let you know a little bit about who everyone is and, and um, what we're doing to uh, try to push forward data access and sharing. So here's a little look at the agenda. Uh, we're going to uh, give you a little bit about Green Button, just a touch. Uh, if you look all the way to the bottom, we're going to have a Green Button 101 at the end of this whole thing. So if you want to stick around uh, for a little bit longer and learn a little bit more about the, uh, the minutia of things, that's when you can do it. We're going to look at some of uh, the vision, the goals, the achievements of the last year. We're going to uh, take a look at who the new board is. We just uh, finished up some elections, and we want to share that information with you on who's going to be on the board for 2022. And we'll talk a little bit about the North American Energy Data Policies Forward Movement, what's going on with the standard. Next, we're going to hear from a couple wonderful speakers. Uh, we have Usman Syed from the Ontario Ministry of Energy, who's been with us a, a long time, working with us since uh, since 2016 on uh, on all things Green Button. And then we have Donald M. Kreese, who is with the New Hampshire Office of Consumer Advocate. He is the consumer advocate, and it's exciting to have him here. You're going to hear a little bit about uh, what happened in New Hampshire and why it's a model for other states. You're also going to hear some Green Button implementation successes. We'll hear from Daniel Ressler of Utility API, Jeff Hendler from Logical Buildings, Zoran Stojanovic from London Hydro, and Jay Lewis from Big Data Energy Services. At this point, I'd like to hand over the meeting to our chairman, Syed Mir. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome. Uh, this is uh, going to be a tag team with uh, Jeremy and I going through some of the, the overview and then give you an introduction of where, where we are, where we are with certification. Every year we sort of, we look at our vision goals, what have we done accomplishments wise. And, and this is an opportunity for us to share. And every year you'll see we'll have added a new element to where we feel a green button can make a, a more of a value prop and where we can move it forward as well. And as Jeremy mentioned, we're going to do some of the new uh, players in the board. And again, for us, it's always the fact that we, I really want to thank the GBA members. Uh, this is a nonprofit organization. I want to thank you for your time and contribution. And also, I'd like to really start with the, uh, the staff, GBA staff, Jeremy, Don, and Valdez, who have really been, even through COVID last year, uh, you know, been really putting a lot of time and effort. Uh, we, we would never slow down in a sense, right, in the sense of trying to service uh, and make sure that we're trying to look at helping uh, people understand what is green button and, and moving forward to, to get value so even though it's been a tough year for all of us we i think i wanted to thank the the staff in particular for their efforts and particular for valdez and jeremy and don who spent a lot of nights and things like that even for this presentation took a lot of work uh, to get here so moving next slide is really about where we are as a vision uh it's sort of the one-stop shop if you want to think about it on where we want to have information and uh, what and how we do our mission, our, our mission is really focused and in a sense purpose. I think now you'll see more people talk about what our purpose is, is, is really. And those three circles on the right, the Venn diagram there, show you really what our, our, our purpose is here. And the purpose really for us starts with education. It's really under people understanding. You can call us the virtual library if you want and where we want to look at things. Uh, we've got expertise that's available for you to, to, to access as well uh, to understand that and, and, and move forward. The second is really to enhance the standard, working with NASB, and, and we have done that, and that's one of our major accomplishments uh, as we go forward, and to look at where we are going and where it should be going. And, and I think I really would want to acknowledge this is this group is broad representation, and we need to get input on where we should be going. And I think we have a, a very good opportunity here. This forum is the place to, to see where we want to go as overall ecosystem. The other key part for us is testing and certification. So our key piece is that to ensure that we stay the compliance, the fact that uh, there's a standard in place, we really want to make sure from a 
data custodian point of view, we're following it so that when we can really grow the ecosystem with third parties. So the key one of the things we look at is really going to be how effectively we can onboard them. How do we make sure? And then I, for us, it's really talking about uh, taking away the borders and 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 letting things go. You know, especially right now with North America and back and forth with applications and so forth. So we really need to let people, and the driver really is, and you'll hear more about customer choice. So, so what testing and certification is important. Right now we post, focused obviously on the data custodian. We are looking in and we have plans and we have to revisit a little bit more on third parties as well. And the key part is there, it's the customer owns the data. How do we give that confidence to the customer that they can go ahead and use this app or download the data and know that the privacy and security is maintained and to make sure that that's part of what this certification gives us, both from the utility side and for the customer and third parties that we, we're, 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 we're effectively managing everything as we go forward. So it's that whole ecosystem that we want to grow. The next slide, I'd really like to welcome three new uh, board members, and this is part of our election uh, process that we do. And Bill Fitzer, I guess, uh, Bill, I, I know you're, you were a previous member, and now you've been elected for a two-year term. Do you mind uh, unmuting and just say a few words and what you and how excited you are? I hope of uh, yeah, no, absolutely excited and sorry. Um, I tried to start my video and it said uh, cannot start video, so that's just a symptom of the world we live in these days. But um, but do want to thank uh, Jeremy Sayed, everyone involved in GBA. Um, you all are doing great work, uh, necessary work, and um, I mentioned to to Jeremy earlier that, you know, I, I'm excited and it's an honor to be part of the, the board of directors again, um, really looking forward to uh, the, the next two years and, and well beyond. So uh, looking forward to it, uh, reconnecting and, um, and the potential that we have in front of us. So thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. Jeff uh, Hedler uh, from Logical Buildings. So Jeff, if you want to unmute. Hi. If it works. Yeah, um, thrilled, excited. Um, want to continue uh, providing a real life case study of uh, the value of green button and thank you to Jeremy and Syed and, and the whole team Valdis, uh, you know, for the, this privilege and look forward to sharing insights uh, later in the presentation. Jeff, does that mean you get like 20 bills or something from those meters in the back? That, that that's right. There it is. <laughs> that's that's the, the silent transformation going on that below the deck. I do not want to pay your bill. <laughs> and speaking of Bill, I see Bill got, got his video going. Oh, video. Nice to see you, Bill. Thank you. And uh, Jay Lewis from Big uh, Data Energy Services. Okay. Hello. Hopefully you guys can, can see me here. Um, no, I'm, I'm super excited. I, my, the first year has been, been really great. Uh, and I think uh, just going forward, all the things we're going to be able to do uh, with uh, the green button standard and, and, and format and uh, so really excited. Thank you guys to, to the team uh, for embracing me this first year uh, and looking forward to second year. Welcome and uh, look forward to, to work, working with you. Next is really, I'd like to acknowledge the, uh, all the board members and, and I'm gonna go down again the list here and uh, have an opportunity for, for, for each to speak and say a few words. Starting with API, Daniel, if you wanna, as vice chair, introduce yourself and that's what's happening. Awesome. Um, well, I, I guess I will go over a little bit of that um, later on during my slides. Uh, I thank you, uh, Syed, for a uh, wonderful last year. Utility API, we are a software vendor for utilities and third parties, a uh, platform for accessing utility data, um, including Green Button Connect. Um, we've actually implemented four um, Green Button Connects to date uh, with more in the pipeline. Um, and so very excited to be a part of this organization. And I want to really uh, thank Daniel. I think he's done a lot of calls, puts a lot of time into it, both from the, uh, uh, you know, from helping us where we're going from a strategy point of view, but also the technical expertise he brings to the table for the discussion. So I want to thank you, Daniel, for that. Thank you. Okay. And Travis, uh, anybody from Energy? Is he on? Uh, John from Home Connect. Hi, everybody. Um, a pleasure to be here today. My first time at the uh, annual general meeting. And uh, as my two year term draws to a close, just want to thank everybody for uh, their collaboration these past two years and wish everyone the best of luck going forward. We've got some new capable people coming on board and really excited about the uh, 
the groundwork that the GBA has been able to lay throughout the country so that businesses like UmConnect can expand beyond our base in California and continue to bring services to folks around the country and around the world. And John, uh, thank you very much. You, you know, as the secretary, you produced some excellent minutes and, and really captured the thoughts sometimes, as you can tell during our meetings, we're sort of all over the place and talking about things, but John did an excellent job of really getting it down to be concise and, and decisions and direction. So thank you very much. And, uh, and uh, thank you very much for your contribution there. Uh, as we said, we just talked, heard about from Bill. Jonathan, uh, are you on the call from NACEB? Again, uh, Jonathan and the NASB group, again, for example, being on the calls and helping when we're looking at uh, the, the standard and where we are. Uh, we, as we on the top right, we Jeff, uh, again, from Logical Bindex. Uh, Chris Urban, I don't think he's on the call, but uh, he is back again. And <laughs> it was a little bit of a, an absence from the uh, US Department of Energy, I guess, based on where we're going. But now he's now actively or will be engaged in, in, in our future board meetings and direction of where we go. As we mentioned, Jay, uh, we also have en Enbridge. Is Tracy on from Enbridge? Uh, again, uh, for for Enbridge, uh, at this point, they were part of our, and so Aaron will talk a little bit about that as well, about our announcement. And, uh, and, and Enbridge was very supportive of, of what we're doing as far as uh, rolling out Green Button there. And uh, David from NIST. And again, I'll say that right now, we want to thank David for his funding, <laughs> for his grants and continuous support. and. Uh, Without NIST, you know, helping us so with the funding and looking at particular areas and pockets and developing documentation and helping with the, the standard. And again, I really want to thank uh, NIST for continuous support, and we look forward to future grants as well. Thank. You. Anyway, so that's the board, and and there's that makes up the eleven board members we have now. To round things off, I just want to show you uh, the fact that what today we have a number of uh, utility members uh, and what we call service providers and also affiliated uh, organizations that we have. We're looking for some affiliated uh, organization potentially that could be coming in by next year. So uh, we we're hoping by next year, we'll have that as, as Jeremy as our target for us to bring in a couple of affiliates in as well uh, from, uh, to, to expand and share membership and talk about things as well. So that's one of the directions we're, we're gonna look forward. So overall, we've got 32 uh, members. And I think as we speak, we might have another one by the time we finish this meeting. So. Uh, and really, again, uh, for the efforts uh, and thank you for renewing your membership and for new members, welcome. Um, as you'll see that uh, Valdez does a spotlight every time on newsletters. So anybody here, you know, get to Valdez. She, she's more than happy to help you uh, put something together. Likewise, uh, for our AGMs, and I'm hoping next year we should be able to do a face-to-face. -face. We usually piggyback on some sort of conference. We'll have an opportunity to, to meet and maybe even go out for dinner and network a little bit but there will be opportunities for, for showcasing successes at, at future AGMs or even on the website or through a webinar. Make this what you'd like as far as communicating your success, because that's what we need. We need to be able to have successes and, and communicate and, and where we're going. Next slide, we, we really wanted to uh, talk about the uh, green button value uh, proposition. This is a slide we've used uh, a number of times. Uh, on the right, you'll see you know, it's really about customer choice and it's about making sure it's secure and, and easy to use and, and it all the types of data that we have natural gas water usage electricity and, and where we are maintaining privacy giving control for and, I, and again from our point of view uh directionally what we want to do is to be able to give customer choice means it's not just reporting on the bill but able to actually reduce your consumption and control it and also having a predictability on your bill and then now you'll talk about the fact that how green I can be as well. So, I mean, there's the concept of moving forward in, in our value prop, I think is evolving and will continue to evolve. From the bottom, you'll see that we're talking about, there's a demand for more and more real-time data. How do we get it? And yes, green button will work. It doesn't need an AMI network. It doesn't have to be real-time. It'll work with monthly data, whatever you, you like. But as you see, whether it'll support where, where we would wanna go, even to the point where we're talking about IoT, and as far as anything, like consumes energy or generates energy is in scope of what it is and what we need to look at every meter points or whatever feeding into a standard platform that's certified by gba now it used to be ul so this is something needs to be maybe updated to be uh, with with the with gba and the fact that it's either comes through the utility as an offering that they can white label and bring forward 
because it's easier for third parties to sell to a utility to get all their customers. In other cases, it might be easier for them to go, for example, directly to commercial industrial customers and, and, and get them signed up and, and do that as well. And it's going towards what we call the app store concept where we're looking at things and in the future they could be rated and, and customers will pick and choose uh, some of these applications that, that help. And it really, at the end of the day, about empowering the customer and it's customer choice. And I, as, as I mentioned earlier, it really spans utility. If I can tell you what we're doing is focusing our attention, not from just say the utility or the generation side, it's flipping it over to be more focused on the consumer side. So consumer drives it. And you've seen the successes of all these big companies is they've gone and looked at the consumer side. So to, the, an example of that is if I want solar and I can't get it, how do I get access to community solar? That's coming from the consumer side as opposed to the other side say, hey, we should create some. It's gonna be driven by the consumer. It's like EVs adoption, what's going on? What is information do people need on the consumer side from range anxiety, looking at what, you know, what the cost is gonna be. It's gonna drive and that will drive where EV charging happens as opposed to, and how to shift it as opposed to try and look at things. So it's trying to look at things from a really a customer focused uh, direction and, and looking at where, and that's where the value prop comes in from. It, I'm not saying one company utility, there'll be stuff there that's gonna be value. But again, it, it is uh, more it's customer driven. And we're just going th through cost of service rate filing. A question's always asked is what's it mean to the customer? And we wanna keep that in mind when we talk about green money. The next slide is, is a little bit of another view of this data, which is what we're talking about is basically it's about open data different participants, different things that have to happen to engage. And at the end of the day, it's got to be better decisions. What's that mean for me from, uh, from being, you know, helping me my bill or the environment or, or, or in the business case, how do I, you know, where, how do we grow jobs and so forth? So it's looking at this from different uh, sense of all different players and then how do we do that? Next slide is really, what we do every year is to look back and see what, what's where we are. There's some things that are we're sort of continuing with, and for example, membership, our goal would be to have this going up <laughs> at one point. Uh, uh, and right now it's more or less level or we're continuing, we're on the right path of, uh, of doing that. We did get hit a little bit with COVID and, and so forth and some of the areas around property management been slow. So we need to do that. Uh, the other thing I'll put a pitch out and, and Jeremy, we've always, we need more sponsor members. Ideally, we have space on the board. <laughs> you can help. The more sponsor members, it helps us because not only from you know, the fact that we have more people at the table to look at where we wanna go and, and, and that commitment. So I would put a, a request out for more sponsor members. Influence and standard, I think we've done a, a, a really good job and, and worked with NASB and they published the next st that standard in 2020 and the open ADE calls that have been happening and, a lot of participation and on that piece and what's going on and where we need to do. Next is around global adoption. We thought we'd be for better, a little bit farther off now. That's why it's dropped. In particular with Europe and others, we were really trying to promote this that rather than them present, you know, developing their own standard, why don't you use the North American standard? What works here? It's gonna get a, a number of years it's taken us for it to get here. We can fast track that. Even if their standard references ours as a starting point, and to, to do what's necessary. So we're really pushing that, even though I know we've got it now translated into Korean, which is one success um, that we've had, but we still put it a little bit of down because we were expecting a little bit more on, 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 on others leveraging the standard. Certifications on is, is a high or moving up because of the fact that we've got more interest now, I'd get, particularly given the Ontario stand uh, legislation that requires certification in the next two years. So we see that this is, it's going to be good because there will be a bigger queue now set up for, for that. As far as the place to go, uh, you know, for repository, we say, yep, yeah. we always believe that there's going to be more stuff that can be done. So that's why we feel that, you know, it's more level. As far as implementation and utilization, uh, there's been more and uh, mandates and where we are, but I, we're encouraging this as something that we can go over with as well. So the next slide, I'll, I'll just start with where we are. I've used this slide just so you're aware uh, the bottom right you see that we had our energy minister and, and our mayor and others on Monday come to uh, to, uh, to London to announce in November 1st and Usman will talk a lot more about about this uh, from a ministry point of view 
but we wanted to, one of the slides that we had up was the fact that there was 10 states and that are got green button mandate. And now Ontario was the first province. Uh, the real challenge would be if we can get all of Canada would be, would be great uh, that we're looking at. So that's what's happening on the, uh, on, on, on the Canadian side. And I'll now hand it over to uh, Jeremy for the US side here. Thank you, Syed. Yeah, we've got a lot going on uh, in New York. They're working on a centralized platform that uh, for what they call an integrated energy data resource. Uh, this is essentially a platform that is uh, that is being mirrored off of some of the uh, efforts that have been going on in New Hampshire, which you'll hear about a little bit later. Uh, and uh, they have been working diligently to uh, to get things moved forward. Uh, the Green Button Alliance is uh, is uh, going to be uh, instrumental in this, we're going to be uh, certifying and testing that final implementation. And there's uh, several different things going on that uh, that you can see here on the screen. And uh, this is supposed to be uh, very soon, I think we're going to be looking at uh, some some point next year of seeing some uh, some real uh, traction on this right now there's been a lot of meetings, there's been some um, RFPs put out for people who are going to be involved in this. And so all of those things are, are sort of putting themselves into place to hold things up, uh, to lift things up, let me put it that way. Uh, we have uh, PowerPath DC. This is an effort within the District of Columbia where uh, their primary provider of energy there is PEPCO. And they've been directed to, uh, to include green button, uh, connect my data in that. Uh, right now, it's, uh, it's, it's for years, it's, it's been uh, uh, available for federal buildings in that area. And now it'll be rolled out to all the different residential customers as well. So some of those things are uh, being implemented now. They're figuring out which type of uh, data they want to share. So um, all of that will uh, culminate in a couple of weeks and uh, then we'll have a firm directive. We've got uh, some new things happening now in Connecticut. So their public utility commission has begun discussing green button connect my data and looking to uh, looking to the alliance and others for uh, help and education in that process. We also have quite a bit going on uh, up in the northeast now. Uh, Maine had issued an RFP for the creation of a statewide uh, multi use platform uh, like New Hampshire's in fact basing everything that they're doing on this on the uh, the successful getting to that point stage. Uh, that was done in New Hampshire. So uh, New Hampshire has been quite the lead in these things. And they were the first one to, uh, to designate this, this multi-use online data platform that was, uh, that was fully green button and uh, to be certified by the green button. And that was uh, signed by uh, their governor, Sununu, uh, recently. And so uh, that process is going on. We're going to hear a little bit more about that later on. Uh, from one of our great keynote speakers, uh, Don Kreese. And then, of course, in Ontario, I think, uh, I think uh, Syed explained to you that on November 1st, there were some great announcements there. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to, uh, to expose that lead just yet. I'm going to allow uh, Usman Syed to talk about some of that when he comes up. But there is a data regulation in place that went effect on the 1st. And uh, GB will, uh, Green Button Alliance will be certifying uh, devices or implementations rather. So I'm going to leave that one alone so, uh, so he can talk a little bit more about how that's going to go. There are more. Uh, we have a whole lot of these listed underneath our happenings page. So if you, if you take a look to our happenings page, if you just hover over that on our website, any page of our website, and then you, you uh, scroll down, you'll be able to select what's going on in different areas. We try to keep these up to date. This is a direct link to uh, either legislation or the latest uh, releases from different groups. Uh, so you'll see this list change quite a bit, not just in the number of states and provinces that are added, but also in uh, where that link takes you. So keep that in mind that that's a resource if you're interested in what's going on in that particular state or province. Uh, speaking of which, on this website, we also have some stats we want to share with you, which we do every year. I'll be brief. Uh, we just want to let you know that of the two websites that we maintain, the greenbuttonalliance.org, uh, which is really where you find all of the, the finite details about Green Button, 
and the greenbuttondata.org, which is sort of a landing page for most consumers and those who are just learning about uh, this thing called Green Button. So we get about, uh, uh, we, we get a lot of different interest here, but uh, in the last year, and I say uh, last year being from this date uh, all the way wrapped around until this date this year, uh, we're looking at about uh, 29,000 page views in about 15,000 sessions uh, for, for the Green Button Alliance website. Most of that's coming from the United States, a good portion from Canada, uh, and some interest in some other countries as well. Most people know exactly what they're looking for when they come to our site. About 56% of that is direct traffic that's headed directly to our site uh, afresh, uh, while a quarter of it is, uh, is a generic, or I should say an organic search, which is where you're basically looking for more information about what this green button is. On the green button data side, you'll see there's over 40,000 page views and 24,000 sessions. Again, this is a this is the first uh, triage area, if you will, for folks wanting to learn about green button. Uh, we have the majority of it again from the United States, a decent portion from Canada, and a little bit of a different mix from uh, from other countries that are coming into that. About half of those folks are direct, while nearly half are organic searches. So. Uh, that tells you that they are finding the correct drop-in site there at greenbuttondata.org. Uh, and we're always looking to keep it updated with fresh and new things. We'll be adding developer things at that point as well to redirect people to certain developer sites that will help them out later. So that's one of those, uh, those vertical lines that Syed spoke about just a moment ago. We're trying to make that uh, point upward and, uh, and get you some more resources uh, to be able to self-serve. But we're always here, of course, uh, for, uh, for support for members and also for non-members uh, with paid time. Okay, all that said, we've got some social media things that are going on. We've got a lot of research uh, that happens on, on what's going on with our member companies. And then we do outreach uh, through newsletters, uh, through Twitter. We have over 2,000 followers on Twitter. We have uh, LinkedIn with about 340 professionals there. We have uh, we have a newsletter that goes out every every uh, two months or so, and has a, a lot of detail. And we highlight members, we point things out. You'll notice uh, that even if you're a non-member, you can still get the newsletter, so you can keep abreast of what's happening uh, between uh, this point uh, now and next year when we have another AGM that you'll be welcome to attend again. And uh, we want you to spread the word uh, using the hashtags of green button and the other ones shown here on the screen so that you can uh, uh, let us know what's going on in your in your part of the green button ecosystem. Uh, okay, Syed, I'm going to throw it back to you. Tell us a little bit more about where you want things to go and uh, what we're doing. Yeah, and I'd like to start with looking at where we want to go next year and in particular is, is, our, is our strategic focus. So it's still to promote the, what we call energy data value creation. A lot of it is to facilitate, and there's three elements to that. One is it's it focused on affordable energy, and, and that's again, to provide customers with choice and technology that they can control their consumption rather than waiting for the bill to show up and, and they can't do anything about it. So how do we be more proactive? We also want to make sure that we enable our customer access to customers to get social assistance programs or whatever it's involved to make that happen. The second is to enable economic development. It's really about the jobs and even COVID and the impact and whatever. I think that's even more important now that we've got businesses that need to, to be able to now get going and, and grow and, and create jobs. And it's all about the environment and where we are and where the action plans are, what we can all do our part and what we want to do. So having a look at that, I want to just introduce you to a concept that I think I'm, I'm hoping most of you are familiar with, but this next slide is for next year, I think we need to focus on how does energy data enable ESG? This is something that uh, Jay Lewis from Big Energy Data raised uh, to us as well. And, and as we as a company have now started in our ESG framework, looking at prioritizing, look at our strategic plan to see how do we do this in, in a structured fashion. The key part from the environmental for us is really going to be looking at how do we promote more EVs, I think is top of mind, everyone, is how do we do that, how we look at solar and, and what we can do from an environmental point of view of stewardship, not, our, not only ourselves, our footprint, but our footprint of our customers and what we can do there. There's an element of social 
uh, criteria responsibility in the sense of what we're looking for diversity and looking at how do we help people in need and and take advantage of programs and, and target uh, where and then again this will be new business models and where solar would be put in all those will be driven by data everything is going to require data to be helped in that front then there's a whole element of governance we need to look at a new lens now as we look at our projects and initiatives it's going to have to include all this to look at what we can help and and that's what you're going to see now a lot of things companies looking at things and trying to look at say how do i move forward uh, from being part of our strategic plan corporate goals and projects where do we are putting our money in respect to this framework so just want to like highlight that and we'd like to have that feedback anyone who has something on, on whether this is sort of not in line and you know or yes you know you think this is should have more of our attention in the next pulse calls or or next meetings you know that we can bring experts in that can talk about that and then say where where they lie and where the data requirements and where third-party access will be required to make things happen so what i've done in the next slide is really uh, wanted to highlight normally i've been around a long time and we always said it was about the people, process, and technology. Like those, if you had those right, you're, you know, you're, you're in, in a good basis. And, and we've worked on that and tried to do that when we looked at things. With, I think there's another pillar now that we've added. I think now an environment has become, and, and it's going to be driven. All of this has to be foundational data. You need data about people, their skills. What do you have? What is, what do you need? You need data to know about what process you're talking about. How do I need real time data, or this? Can I have a batch process? When is you know my service levels and technology? Is it in the cloud or is it on-prem? Is it an app? Is it is it not? It, it, all data is going to feed all this stuff, and then the environment is a big piece. We need to know if you're going to reduce it. You need to know where your footprint is today, and it's not just going to be done on the energy side. It's going to and why we call these digital pillars. These are what companies are going to use to transform and transform into a digital age, which will require. AI, machine learning, blockchain, all these things are coming down from a technology point of view. We could be there to help to promote third-party access. I'm not saying we're doing everything, but it's a model that we're talking about here. If you, the more you promote and you avoid these data silos, the better we will all be off in what we're doing. So I just wanted to look at that and say, this is sort of an outlook and leave that with you to more ponder at the, in future discussions. And please let us know how, how you feel on on helping us tackle the problem. This is where we continue as a group to look at what the value prop would be. So now I'll hand it over to uh, Jeremy to introduce our keynote speakers. Yeah, it's a perfect segue too, because our keynote speakers are also pillars in the Green Button community. Uh, so this is uh, exciting for me to introduce to you uh, our first speaker, uh, Usman Syed, the Director of Conservation and Energy Efficiency at the Ontario Ministry of Energy. As I mentioned before, Usman's been uh, been with us, uh, helping us along, guiding us since the mid uh, 2016. Uh, he's he's basically responsible for the policy implementation, of the province's electricity and natural gas conservation programs, and uh, as well as energy efficiency standards and regulations. So uh, he was instrumental in uh, in spearheading this Ontario regulation that uh, was just announced on the first. So uh, we are thrilled and excited to have Usman join us on, uh, uh, on this call today and share with you a little bit more about what's happening there. Usman, are you, uh, are you available, unplugged and uh, plugged in and, uh, and ready, to, ready to show? I think I'm ready to go. Thanks very much, Jeremy. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on uh, where you are. I understand we have uh, folks from uh, across uh, North America today, so that's great. Uh, and, and thank you very much for you know giving me a little bit of time today to share with you uh, the Green Button experience, uh, as it were, in Ontario. Uh, the first thing that I'd like to do is maybe echo some of the comments that uh, Syed made off the top and recognize the, the GBA, um, you know, the incredible work that they have done and continue to do really to uh, promote and advance the standard. Um, you know, their work has really paved the way for Green Button adoption in several jurisdictions. And I can say with confidence that the work that they've done has also helped uh, what we have achieved in, in Ontario as well. So thank you for that. Uh, and kudos to Syed Mir, uh, the chair of the GBA, the board members, and the uh, incredible staff that are helping you know, utilities, uh, PUCs, regulators, 
you know, software providers, app developers, and really just so many others take advantage of the value that that green button can provide. So, so with that uh, little intro, uh, the first thing I want to do is give you an idea of Ontario's uh, landscape and its and its energy landscape. Um, the first point on the slide I want to make is that uh, you know Ontario is a province uh, in Canada, and it is the most populous uh, province in the country with 14.5 million residents, and it is quite large. Uh, to give you some perspective, it is 40% larger than Texas. So if you can imagine, it does uh, stretch out quite far to the north, east, west, and south uh, towards our neighbors uh, in, in, the, in the United States as well. And the temperatures in Ontario can vary greatly. We have really hot summers and bitterly cold winters. Uh, we have highly remote areas and super dense urban areas. In fact, most Ontarians live in the southern part of the province, uh, closer to the border uh, with the US and the rest of the province is remote and extremely sparsely populated, uh, you know, with a few smaller Indigenous communities uh, throughout. So for the 5.3 million electricity customers we have, there are approximately 65 LDCs that serve them. And there's one main uh, natural gas distributor that serves the vast majority of customers with a few uh, smaller natural gas utilities that are um, serving some municipalities and, and some regions. So, um, you know, from that perspective, it, there are quite a few utilities operating in the province. Uh, that said, almost all electricity customers have smart meters, which are capturing uh, data at a minimum of one hour intervals. But these smart meters come from different manufacturers. In fact, there's, there's five different AMI systems operating the province. So what is, why am I saying all this? What does this mean for Ontario? There are millions of energy uh, consumers in the province. They're served by several different LDCs. Uh, there's little consistency in the way that Ontario customers can get access to data today. Uh, most of the solutions that are available uh, to provide access are proprietary to the utility. So there's actually little room for customers to benefit from more market-driven creativity. That said, there is still a plethora of data being collected, but not everyone is taking advantage of it. So perhaps we can jump over to the next slide and, and take a look at what some of these uh, drivers have been for, for Green Button in Ontario, based on what I, you know, I just mentioned, that we have all these smart meters, uh, data is being collected. So the question is, how can we use this data to address some of the challenges we have in the province? Um, how can we leverage our existing investments that have already been made in AMI to further benefit our customers? And I have to say that at the time Ontario rolled out smart meters, uh, you know, probably 10 or 15 years ago now, the business case uh, was not based on implementing green button. It really just it wasn't there at the time, and and it was you know it was a, a, a tough sell with our with our with our auditor general. Um, if only I could just imagine if if only green button was around at the time, we could have built that into our business case, and would, we would have been able to show that value uh, really early on. Um, so that said, in Ontario, there there really has been a real focus on energy prices and energy affordability. And, you know, Syed mentioned the strategic focuses of, of energy affordability, uh, economic development, and, uh, and reducing our carbon footprint. And I, I think that really resonates um, with some of the challenges and some of the goals, longer term goals um, that we have in place in Ontario and, and really inform some of the, the near term policies uh, as well that we're working on. But energy affordability, you know, continues to be an issue for residential uh, and small business owners, as well as commercial, industrial, and institutional customers. Uh, Green Button really provides an opportunity for these customers to take advantage of solutions that can help them gain better insights into their energy consumption and, and find opportunities to uh, improve their conservation efforts. Um, the other interesting thing about Green Button in Ontario is that it has largely been customer driven. We have had some very vocal uh, groups approach governments uh, asking for Green Button as a solution uh, to help their businesses. For example, uh, BOMA, they're a, a group that represents large building owners. They've asked for Green Button to help them manage their, you know, their clients' corporate towers. Uh, in Ontario, 
we have a program called EWRB or Energy Water Reporting and Benchmarking. It's actually uh, based on programs that were implemented earlier in the United States. Uh, I know it's prevalent in, in New York, uh, Philadelphia, San Francisco, Chicago, among some jurisdictions. Um, so this is where building owners are required to report their energy consumption into a system called Portfolio Manager, which is uh, developed by the US EPA. And it, it really is uh, a manual process. Someone has to go in and enter uh, this consumption data into the Portfolio Manager. Uh, so now, uh, based on Green Button, we are working with our counterparts in, our, in the federal government um, uh, to look for ways to automate that transfer of, of data from the utility to the portfolio manager system based on cu uh, customer authorization and you know thereby saving time and money uh, and allowing that uh, customer to easily benchmark their energy usage against themselves year over year and, and with other like buildings. So this is something that you know, Green Button is going to help with uh, as, as an example, among several other examples. Uh, also, I just wanted to share that Canada's five largest banks uh, have jointly written a letter uh, in the past to, to government asking them to implement uh, Green Button. Demand response aggregators have been quite involved in making the case for Green Button in the province as well. Uh, they, you know, they can use the data uh, that they get through Green Button to help them verify contributions uh, that they make towards demand reductions and settle with system operators. Um, there are also several other programs that are in operation throughout the province uh, from electricity and a natural gas perspective that can really take advantage of having that easier, uh, authorized, secure, you know, private access to data in that consistent format. And that's something that's really exciting for Ontario. So if we jump over to the next slide, I, I quickly just wanted to run you through uh, our journey uh, with Green Button. It really started uh, soon after the call to action that uh, had come from the U.S. government back in, in 2012. And at that time, we started out on a voluntary basis and leaders in Ontario's utility space, like London Hydro, of course, and, and Hydro One launched some early pilots to test out the technology. And the government of Ontario showed early support as well through sponsoring uh, green button app contests and and really explicitly calling out our support for green button through some major government publications including our long-term energy plans uh, climate change plans and these are really um, substantive and weighty documents that outline the direction for the province in those spaces you know following on that we made some legislative changes in 2017 to enable us to proceed with regulatory changes uh, there are also further acknowledgements made in government uh, publications in economic through our Ministry of Economic Development. And then our regulator just this past summer uh, embarked on some consultations with the Green Button Task Force to, to come up with some, some guidance materials to support the implementations of, of Green Button. And based on all that, I'm really pleased to say that Ontario has uh, passed a regulation to mandate the implementation of Green Button for all electric and gas utilities in the province. Uh, and I think Jeremy mentioned earlier that just became effective this past Monday, so November 1st, uh, 2021. Uh, and that announcement took place in London, Ontario. So again, I want to th uh, thank and congratulate uh, Syed uh, and Zoran and their colleagues uh, for supporting that event with our Energy Minister, Todd Smith, and, and really showing their leadership in that space. So now I just want to quickly go over with you um, what our green button regulation actually covers. If you want to look it up and get details on it, it is um, in on the uh, elaws.ca website. It's under the Ontario Electricity Act. Um, first off, the regulation applies to all electric and natural gas utilities in the province. And from an implementation perspective, it requires that the solution um, that utilities implement is the NASB SB standard or, or green button as, as we call it. Uh, referencing NASB is important because it ensures that the standard is maintained and managed by an established known organization. Uh, we also require that the implementation of the standard is certified by the Green Button Alliance. Uh, I think that was referenced earlier uh, in the introductory comments uh, by Syed and Jeremy as well. Certification is 
really important because it is it, it's what is going to ensure the consistent implementation across the province. So regardless of, of uh, the green button application or, or software uh, a customer chooses to use, they can be certain that it works consistently across any service territory in the province. Uh, so far as timing, we're seeking to have the standard implemented by November 1st of 2023, so two years uh, from the date the regulation became effective. Uh, and this gives time for utilities to you know, procure a green button platform that they want to use or, or partner up with other utilities so they can, um, you know, if they have joint, if they have similar billing systems, that, that would make sense or, you know, find an existing green button platform that they can leverage. Uh, and perhaps, the, you know, the two-year schedule that we're, uh, we're looking at as well can help with um, utilities that perhaps have an existing IT refresh cycle. So, you know, they can line up with that and they would only have to open up the hood once, if you will. And of course, there will be some extensions uh, and exemptions that are um, that we've recognized in the regulation as well. So just moving on to the next slide. Um, as far as the next steps uh, for Green Button in Ontario, um, I mentioned over, over the summer, our regulator, the Ontario Energy Board, worked with a task force to develop some, some guidance materials to help utilities and implementers of Green Button with their deployments. Uh, again, to ensure that consistent implementation across the province. Uh, so further to that task force activity, there are plans for an industry-led implementation working group, which will really get into more of the specific technical details regarding implementation and hopefully provide you know, even greater guidance to ensure utilities are able to roll out uh, Green Button in the most cost-effective manner. But I think that you know, the most exciting part for um, you know, the future of Green Button Ontario is the prospect of, of having more tools available uh, to customers to help them optimize their energy consumption, you know, conserve energy and, and contribute to, to climate change goals. So the rollout of, of more Green Button applications and services that customers can take advantage of is, is really the next push after the standard is implemented. Uh, so with that, uh, I, I want to thank you for, for listening, um, and I'm happy to take any questions or uh, right now or later, and um, I'll pass back to Jeremy. Well, thank you very much, uh, Usman. That was fantastic news. I think, uh, I, I think people don't realize the scope of this. You talked about how large uh, Ontario is, and it's enormous. When you, when you get a globe in front of you, you can really get a perspective. Uh, but I think uh, folks may have a question on how many utilities are roughly uh, affected by this this um, regulation to implement Green Button. Can you share that with us? Yeah, totally. Um, there are, I'd say, roughly seventy utilities in the province that would uh, that would be required to implement. So I'm including electricity, and natural gas, uh, between sixty and seventy. That's fantastic. Yeah, when we talk about the states, we're, we're, we're dealing with a handful of utilities per state, typically. Uh, we have some larger states, of course, but, uh, but to, to try to fathom uh, 60 to 70 utilities is, uh, in, in one place is, is pretty intense. So uh, that's pretty exciting. Thank you very much. Thank we you. appreciate that. I also want to uh, uh, welcome our next speaker. Donald M. Kreese. He is the Office of Consumer Advocate Advocate. So he is the uh, he's the guy in charge and uh, and uh, driving things forward. Uh, Don ha Don is a, a frequent guest of many local different uh, TV stations, regional news outlets, and so forth. Uh, his role is to be the advocate on behalf of the interests of residential utility customers uh, in front of the Public Utility Commission and other venues. Um, uh, and if I, th if, I, if I can quote you uh, from a time back, uh, it is to make sure those folks, the, the customers, the residential customers get a decent deal. So uh, I will introduce Don and he will tell you what he's done up in, uh, up in New Hampshire. Don, are you, uh, are you with us? You got audio and video here? I believe that I do at least. Uh, yes, I do. There you go. Perfect. Okay. So, um, I, I want to get a little personal here. Uh, so on the screen is the back of my old Prius. And 
at least I can't see all of it, but if you look at my license plate, it says N1303K on it. And that probably looks to all of you like a random set of numbers and letters, but it actually isn't. That happens to be a genetic mutation. And I have that genetic mutation on my one half of my chromosome seven pair. And that is a genetic mutation associated with a serious chronic illness known as cystic fibrosis. I don't have cystic fibrosis. My daughter does because her mother also has a similar mutation. And I am convinced, first of all, my daughter, who is 20, is a thriving, fabulous, really healthy, awesome college student. She really is the apple of her dad's eye. Now, had I been born with cystic fibrosis back in 1958 when I came into existence, uh, I am sure that I would be 50 years dead by now. My daughter is thriving. Why is that? Well, in 1964, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation uh, brought one of its up-and-coming pulmonology doctors, Warren Warwick, into its fold and hired him to start a national registry of every single cystic fibrosis patient in the United States. There are 30,000 of them. And the idea is that all of the data about what was happening with these patients would be uploaded to a central registry and thereby it would be possible to ascertain through the use of data what was working, what wasn't working, which care centers were providing the best care, which ones were mediocre. And that has allowed huge progress in the treatment of this disease to the point where it is on the brink of being reduced to a fully controllable medical condition. That matters a lot to me personally. And so when I became consumer advocate in New Hampshire back in 2016, uh, I had a director of finance, Jim Brennan, who was obsessed with data. And it took him all of 10 seconds to convince me what a powerful tool data can be in terms of producing great good on the public policy front. So at the same time I was talking to Jim Brennan about data, I was talking to my friends in the town of Hanover, New Hampshire. Hanover, New Hampshire, some of you may know, is the hometown of Dartmouth College, which is our most prestigious educational institution here in New Hampshire. It has an engineering school, it has a medical school, it has a business school, and it's an undergraduate school. And therefore, Hanover and Dartmouth are very evolved places. And they were trying to develop energy policy initiatives that would put Hanover at the forefront of municipalities when it comes to these questions. And they were getting frustrated because they were trying to get data about how people in Hanover were using their energy from their local electric utility. And even though the electric utility was trying to cooperate with them, they couldn't get the data, even with a cooperative utility. And so there was pressure from the excellent folks in Hanover around this urgent need to acquire utility customer data. And I had Jim Brennan, who was also obsessed with this. And as he started talking to me about it, it became clear to me as a lawyer that what we needed in New Hampshire was legislation. Why legislation? Because uh, that is a explicit directive from the people who make laws in our state that neither the Public Utilities Commission nor the utilities that create all this data were really able to ignore. So I drafted legislation. What did the legislation say? Well, the core components of the legislation that we drafted insisted on using the green button connect my data standard, which we named explicitly in, this, in the bill, uh, as the standard that would, uh, that would drive this initiative. What we also insisted on was a statewide platform because in, in New Hampshire, we're, we're sort of an ideally uh, sized state in the sense that we're a small state of about 1.2 million people, but we have three investor-owned electric utilities and two investor-owned natural gas utilities. And so there are a lot of communities that are served by more than one utility in New Hampshire. And that creates a 
need for data sharing through a set of uniform standards so that if you're an innovative business provider and you want to go into a place like Plainfield, New Hampshire, which is served by three different electric utilities, uh, you want to be able to get the data that you need in a consistent fashion from one place. So in a small state, people are able to work together because we all know each other. Uh, but we're a big enough state with enough utilities in it that there really is a driving need for a statewide utility customer data platform that is standards based so that everybody is basically ha has a one stop shopping destination to go to rather than pinging every individual utility uh, using a reliable and uh, accepted standard like green button uh, connect my data. So that's what we put in the bill. And then, and all of that was help that I got from other people who knew or know way more about this subject as a policy matter than I do. Here is the brilliant thing that I added to our bill. I insisted on directing the Public Utilities Commission to move forward with this project by opening up a contested adjudicative proceeding. Why did I do that? Because I have been burned in the past by regulatory initiatives that are just opened as this general inquiry with nothing to pressure all of the stakeholders and deciders to accomplish anything by a date certain. In New Hampshire, and I think in most other jurisdictions, the adjudicative process drives everybody to a conclusion because there is a date in a schedule that says on this date, we're going to have a hearing and the regulator is going to make a decision. So uh, we did that and it had the desired effect in the sense that it caused all of the stakeholders to get together by becoming formal interveners in the adjudicative process that the Public Utilities Commission here in New Hampshire opened. And that really forced everybody to the table. Now, uh, my friends at the Green Button Initiative uh, think that I pulled off a coup by getting to yes in about a year and a half. I, I have to tell you that that 18 months felt like a really long time to me. I'm glad that other people think that we did it speedily. Uh, but what we did was we brought everybody together and we just pursued a relentless course of uh, meetings with this threat of a hearing looming over everybody that would make the laggards or the obstructionists look bad. So that, that is how we did that. So we got the general court to uh, adopt, the general court is our legislature, to adopt this bill. And to his great credit, uh, our governor, uh, Chris Sununu signed the bill in uh, July of 2019, and that started the year and a half process in, in late 2019. And I, I was really excited to see when uh, you put up on the screen the list of all the members in the um, Green Button Alliance, that among the fairly finite number of utility members is one of our utilities, Unitil, which is based here in New Hampshire. It serves customers in New Hampshire, Maine, and Massachusetts. And I, I really have to give a shout out to my friends at Unitil. They have been excellent collaborators. This work really started with a collaboration that came out of a Unitil rate case uh, between Jim Brennan, who used to be my director of finance, and the folks at Unitil who see the power and importance of data and data sharing. So th that's really cool. And I'm also happy to say that Governor Sununu has just nominated a new PUC commissioner, who uh, Carlton Simpson, who happens to be an attorney who works at Unitil. So I think that is an implicit recognition of the power of this kind of work. And I hope Carlton doesn't have to disqualify himself. So we worked on this project for 18 and a half months. What did we accomplish in those 18 and a half months? Well, I, I wish I could tell you that we are launching our utility customer data platform next week. In fact, we're actually still quite a long way from getting to the launch. But what we developed is a settlement agreement, which I'd be happy to share with anybody, that sets up a, a framework for moving forward with the data platform. The next step in the process is the PUC has to make some kind of determination about whether the benefits of the 
data platform exceed the costs of the data platform. And the standard we put in the bill is that the PUC can call a halt to the whole thing if the costs are deemed to be unreasonable. Uh, and actually, Carlton from Unitil worked very closely with us on getting the language right. Why is that important? Because the benefits of a data platform like this are difficult to quantify because some of them are to be discovered as technologies evolve and as new entrepreneurial firms get into the world of energy services. And you know there are gonna be things that we don't even know about yet that are gonna be benefits of a data platform. So, so that's a bit inchoate. On the cost side, it is very easy to exaggerate the cost of a platform like this, and we are sure that the skeptics are going to do it. How did I get the utilities in my state to sign on to this? Because all of them, even Unitil, are skeptical to a degree, and they don't want outsiders like me fiddling in the back ends of their systems. So what we agreed to, and you know, again, now I'm wading into a technical realm that I'm ill-qualified to talk about, is a model that the utilities called API of APIs. So you have an application programming interface that will be driven on a freestanding web platform. It's really just scraping data out of the back end of utilities. And the utilities are really running their own APIs that are actually controlling how they're processing their customer data inside their system. So we're not going to get into their systems, and that makes them happy. The other piece of this that's really critical is we in New Hampshire, as a matter of public policy, are obsessed with privacy. And let me tell you, as a dad of a baby with cystic fibrosis in 2002, I had to think for a minute before I signed a piece of paper consenting to have all of my daughter's medical data uploaded to the Na National Registry of cystic fibrosis patients. Why did I do that? Because the foundation convinced me that they were going to be super careful with my daughter's medical data. Medical data is as personal as it gets. So with that sense of conviction in mind and knowing it's consistent with the public policy of our state, we made sure that right in our bill is ironclad, ironclad language that is mindful of privacy interests, mindful of cybersecurity concerns, because our, our utilities are correctly obsessed with that, and absolutely require that any time any data is shared via the data platform with some third party, that happens because the customer has specifically consented to that sharing. But at the same time, we don't want to make the platform impractical or unhelpful, particularly to municipalities. So there will be a uh, mechanism whereby aggregated data is shareable according to a reasonable standard so that everybody's privacy is assured, but municipalities and others with, with an interest in aggregated data by zip code or community uh, get that data via the platform. So the other piece of this that was really important to me personally is what I will glibly refer to as adult supervision, because it really is our utilities who are going to build and develop this platform. And naturally, as a ratepayer advocate, I don't place unreserved trust in our investor-owned utilities. I want to make sure that they get uh, some oversight from the likes of me. So I convinced the utilities to agree on what we called a platform governance council. It will rule by consensus. So the utilities essentially have a veto over decisions the governance council will make, but then so will we. And anytime there is sort of one of those lacks of consensus, then that's when we would get the Public Utilities Commission involved. So uh, there is, by way of winding up, because I know I only have a few minutes, there is a, a problem that we're having in New Hampshire in that we worked really hard to uh, create this legislation. Then we worked really hard to get a settlement agreement in place. We signed it. We filed it in early May. There was a hearing before the PUC. May was six months ago now, and the PUC hasn't made a decision yet. So it would be just awesome if everybody who is here on this call or in this, in this little Zoom room were to follow this 
earnest request. All I need is for everybody here to write to the New Hampshire PUC at that email address that I gave you. Make sure you get the docket number right in the subject line, and it's right up there. And then either ask or tell, depending on how polite you are, the PUC to approve what was, after all, a unanimous agreement among all of the stakeholders about how to move this process forward. I don't think our commissioners understand what you've been telling me, which is you're looking to us as a national model. That does not happen here in New Hampshire very often. And it is really cool when the rest of the country and even the rest of North America, because we're talking to Canada too, are looking to New Hampshire as a leader. We don't wanna lose that edge because we're very proud of what we've accomplished here in New Hampshire. So I need your help in prodding our PUC to move forward. When the PUC approves that settlement agreement, we'll be able to move forward and eventually uh, we will build our platform. I, I think that's, uh, that is where I will stop because I could go on all the rest of this afternoon, except to say that in my last slide there is a picture of the second most excellent thing in New Hampshire after our data platform, which is the class of 1945 library at the Phillips Exeter Academy in Exeter, which was designed and built a long time ago by the best American architect of the 20th century, Louis Kahn. Anyway, <laughs> we're really proud of our uh, beautiful Louis Kahn building, and we're also very proud of what we're hoping is our emerging data platform. And I, I thank you for the recognition and the opportunity to talk with all of you today. And of course, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Don. It was much appreciated. That was wonderful uh, uh, to hear. And uh, we do still think of you guys as a leader up there, even if there's a pause, because 18 months is nothing in, in uh, in the blink of the time it takes to move an industry that's been around for uh, for well over 100 years uh, doing the same sort of thing in the same way uh, don't don't fix what isn't broken so we're looking at a lot of interesting things that are coming up i want to toss back to uh, syed uh, for just a moment um, we uh, we do this every year uh, we try to now we're trying to put together some chairman's awards and those types of things so I'd like to uh, hand that microphone, uh, much better microphone than the one I'm wearing, over to Syed Mir. But every year we look at a chairman's award and we decided this year there should be two awards given. We really like to acknowledge this man, your leadership in, uh, in making things happen from day one and, your member and the board being part of it. So we called it an energy data policy leader. If you want to change it, it this is not cast yet. So if you, we, you know, you're welcome to, Change, but you really appreciate it. And I think your persistence, your thought leadership, getting all this stuff, it, I don't know, you were really ever ready, Bunny. I think you, I don't know how you never ran out of energy to make that happen. So thank you very much. And next uh, award, actually, Don, uh, you you looks like you're the Hussein Bolt of this thing based on what how fast you got things done. And you got my vote, by the way, for, for moving things forward. So really wanted to, uh, to acknowledge your advocacy role and, and a policy leader and what you created and what you talked about. So I know we can't mute each other, but just if everybody can just virtually clap and I'll give you a high five for, for, uh, for making a difference and, and making that happen. So thank you. Thank you, appreciate that very much, uh, Saeed and, and the rest of the, the GBA community and, and Green Button community rather. So thanks, I really appreciate uh, the support that that everyone's provided and allowed uh, Ontario to progress uh, the way it has. Uh, it has been uh, a long road, a lot of persistence, uh, but reaching that milestone on on Monday was was huge, and uh, it was it was great. It, it felt it felt good, and, and this just uh, caps it off. So so thanks very much, and and we have a long way to go now. So hopefully there's uh, more of these awards, and we'll strive to <laughs> we'll strive we'll aim to get them in the future as well. <laughs> Thank Bye. you. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, well, I, if I might just say thank you for the recognition, I really appreciate it because as I've explained, this issue is deeply personal to me, but I'm very aware, keenly aware that it's the ratepayers of our state uh, who pay for my office. And so everything, er everything we do is uh, creditable to the uh, beleaguered utility ratepayers of our state who are captive customers of utilities, and they share this award, I think. Thanks a lot. So I'll hand it over to you, Jeremy, for the next uh, agenda item of the accomplishments. Yeah, thank, thanks again uh, to both of you for your leadership. It's fantastic. Um, we also are about to hear from another leader, our vice chair, uh, 
is uh, is up to bat here, and he's going to share with you a number of things that's going on uh, on his side of uh, of the equation, as it were. Thank you, Jeremy, um, and thank you, Syed, and Don. Your presentation was quite insightful. I really appreciate that. Um, uh, howdy, everybody. I'm Daniel Ressler. I, as Jeremy said, I'm the vice chair on the board of the Green Button Alliance. I'm also the founder and chief technology officer at Utility API. Um, as I mentioned in my brief board uh, introduction um, earlier in the uh, AGM, uh, we are a software platform that is uh, basically provides data access uh, as a service for uh, third party companies as well as customers. Um, and in this presentation, um, I'll actually be going through a little bit of background on our um, uh, transition to providing uh, Green Button Connect directly for uh, various uh, utilities in various forms. And I will um, kind of go through that as well. Um, this all, uh, as far as uh, our Green Button Connect system, uh, we have been working on it since 2017 uh, when we are awarded a grant from the Department of Energy uh, Technology to Market. This presentation is going to cover uh, basically uh, several takeaways from the, uh, from the past uh, several years. As I said, um, this started uh, our Green Button Connect implementation process started in 2017 from a Department of Energy grant uh, from their Technology uh, to Market uh, uh, award, uh, which was originally called Sunshot, but I think it's called something else now. And that's specifically focused on providing data access for, quote, the long tail of solar, which is the uh, vast majority of solar companies, and they need um, customer utility data um, in order to size a system or give a quote or uh, analyze a payback period or something like that. And a lot of those companies really struggled with the technical integration side for Green Button Connect. And so our goal was to really lower the barrier to entry for a lot of the small sort of like, you know, less than 10 person uh, solar companies, which is uh, the majority of the industry or it was at the time. And then uh, fast forward, we uh, got our first uh, pilot with a uh, California community choice aggregator, uh, Silicon Valley Clean Energy in 2019. And then our first uh, uh, actual uh, non-pilot contract with a municipal utility in Colorado, Fort Collins Utilities. And uh, this past year, we've actually launched two more green button connects with uh, another CCA and then an investor owned utility in New York. Um, and so we are rolling these things out. It's been, uh, I think, a very, very successful grant from the Department of Energy in getting the technology adoption and the technology to market. So it's a very aptly named thing. So kudos to the Department of Energy for having such an innovative um, uh, program. So what I wanted to talk about in this in this presentation was, you know, we've actually deployed these things and seen how they were used and seen how uh, different audiences reacted to them. And so I thought I would go through some very specific and uh, tangible examples of our lessons learned and takeaways over deploying four green button connects at uh, various utilities. Um, and one of the insights that uh, uh, during our pilot that the administrator of the pilot had at Silicon Valley Clean Energy Amy Bailey um, had was that in general there are three categories that of values, uh, value propositions uh, to um, various audiences that use could use a green button connect. Um, the first category is third party data access, and so this is what you think of as just your traditional green button connect use case. So this is going to be like a third party service provider, say a solar company or energy efficiency company or battery storage company going to a customer and wanting to get their data. And then um, the customer approving that and then the data transfer happening and then doing their sort of feasibility analysis or ongoing measurement and verification or something like that. So that's category one, third party data access is kind of seen as your traditional green button connect. Um, the second category is first party data access. And Syed mentioned this, uh, I think a little bit in his um, in his opening, uh, 
um, around things like uh, ESG measurements or, or large commercial customers who have their own building management systems, um, really being able to automate incorporating, getting the data from the utility into their own internal systems because they kind of are large enough to run their own internal systems. This is a use case that we've actually seen uh, crop up more and more, um, as I had mentioned. And then category three is one that we had no idea would uh, would exist, but we are now finding is starting to become actually the majority of interest for a green button connect, and that is providing data access from a utility to itself. Um, and so, what's interesting about that is if you are a utility and you have you know various programs like an energy efficiency program or a rebate program or some sort of like app that you want to develop, you would you will generally you know have vendors implement that. And those vendors only need an access to some subset of the data. Well, what's really good at you know, providing limited access to data? Well, Green Button Connect is. And so you can, actually, uh, you can actually use or reuse an existing Green Button Connect for um, providing limited uh, managed access to vendors who are implementing your own programs. As I said before, the category one is your traditional use case in Fort Collins. They have a solar uh, approved network of providers um, for in order to enable the tax incentives for, for installing solar. Um, previously, that had been like providing the data access to all of those uh, network solar installers um, has been very manual and virtually all of that has been eliminated. Um, and uh, so like staff does not have to pick up the phone anymore and email spreadsheets of usage to um, third party solar providers. And so um, basically that's all been uh, migrated at this point to Green Button Connect, so much so that the staff is actually now capable of implementing uh, virtual net metering in the coming year for uh, commercial uh, commercial solar, for aggregated uh, virtual net metering for multifamily housing. And so that's very exciting um, that uh, Green Button Connect has basically opened up the capacity for Fort Collins to uh, be able to handle more and more uh, integration of renewables into their into their ecosystem. So that's a that's one of the uh, major benefits of the Category One of just kind of removing a lot of overhead from utility staff. Um, the next one uh, is uh, something that we actually just launched this week with Peninsula Clean Energy. That's a community choice energy or er, agency in uh, our community choice aggregator in California that specifically focuses on commercial self-access. Um, so this is going to be uh, large commercial customers like cities and corporations who have their own energy managers and are looking to get automated data access to their own data sets in a very streamlined and easily readable, uh, readable thing. Um, it's also very self-service. Um, Green Button Connect, can you can just basically create an authorization for your Yourself, um, through the standard and get an API token and get going right away. There's no sort of like very long, you know, connectivity or, 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 or setup process that you would see in like, say, a traditional EDI system or something like that. So that's one of the benefits that we're seeing um, and attract or value um, as we're seeing for category two. And then uh, finally, category three is um, there's two um, specific examples that I wanted to call out that we have seen implemented. Um, the first is with Silicon Valley Clean Energy. Um, the data platform, they, uh, the Green Button Connect, they are calling Data Hive. Um, but specifically, they have a program called GridShift, which is a self-branded uh, Silicon Valley Clean Energy branded app that allows you to connect your uh, charger for your electric vehicle, and then it will charge at time of low carbon intensity to minimize the carbon impact of your EV charging. And so that's basically a load management sort of uh, precursor um, for EV charging, which is, I think, uh, uh, going to gain more and more traction over time. The California Energy Commission has their load management proceeding um, that they are up and coming. Um, but in order to pull all of that off, you have to provide uh, tariff and usage access to that vendor in order to implement it. And with similarly, with the California Energy Commission's uh, load management rulemaking, uh, 
um, they are looking to provide tariff access to um, the third parties implementing these load shifting programs. And so Green Button Connect is kind of being used or uh, reused beyond just the normal third party access to implement utilities own programs to, to great effect. This program has, uh, has really taken off in Silicon Valley clean energy. And then uh, finally, the last uh, category three uh, use case that I, I wanted to specifically note out was uh, Fort Collins has a benchmarking mandate for all of their aggregate or all of their buildings. Um, and it's actually 10 times lower of threshold than California. So it's actually, if you, it, there's, it's probably hard to read, there's a 5,000 square foot and above threshold, which is like, you know, uh, two Taco Bells or something like that. Like it's not a very high threshold for requiring building benchmarking. And as you can assume, um, that's a lot of buildings. And um, prior to implementing their, uh, what they call my data, which is basically their term for their green button connect, um, they were having to fulfill all of these aggregated data requests from building owners to meet this benchmarking mandate. Um, uh, manually and having to do it all manually. And so automating that process and providing that aggregated data access through Green Button Connect and then automating the process of importing that into Energy Star Portfolio Manager um, has been a, a, a very large success that allowed just like the a few city staff who originally like were tasked with doing this to be able to scale this to uh, order of magnitude lower square footage threshold than like the state of California, for example. And so um, that's, I think, a very big win for the uh, the scalability of Green Button Connect for for things that are you wouldn't necessarily consider like third party access, but uh, pr providing that uh, providing that access has really led to a lot of scalability within within these utilities. Um, Okay, so to wrap up, the key takeaways that I wanted to call out was that uh, green. we are finding through actual real world examples that Green Button Connect is becoming critical data infrastructure for a lot of program implementations that are facilitating the energy transition. And so a lot of these programs would not be able to actually work at scale without a Green Button Connect existing in place already. And so it's uh, I, I see Green Button Connect as critical infrastructure for the energy transition. Um, and the second call out that I wanted to do is like Green Button Connect is uh, has an enormous value even beyond just uh, the traditional third party data access model. Um, we are seeing that on the ground. We are seeing that in utilities who implement this. They're finding more and more use cases every time, such as implementing it or reusing it for their own utility programs and aggregate data to access for, for benchmarking requirements. And so thank you uh, very much for, for the time to take you through this, uh, the, the lessons learned that we've seen over the past uh, several years. It's fantastic. Thank you, Daniel, for sharing that. Uh, it's always uh, a pleasure to have you speak on all these different opportunities. Your com company is moving fast and, uh, and taking <laughs> us along with you in your endeavors. And, and we, we can't appreciate it more. Jeff, uh, why don't you please uh, share with us a little bit about what's going on with Logical Buildings and the things you're doing from coast to coast. Sure, thanks, Jeremy. Again, thanks, Jeremy, GBA, uh, Syed, whole team, uh, you know, for enabling these technologies, making it happen. Uh, I know Syed, Syed was talking about, you know, the goal is once you have these technologies available, how do you, how do you bring it to the customer? You know, how do you make it you know, part of their daily life. And we've been out front doing that, building uh, really cool user-friendly, engaging mobile applications that is predicated on Green Button Connect. It, this, that's the, you know, the journey in decarbonization is paved through Green Button because without that data, uh, you couldn't you know, have these tools and have these platforms to engage people to make choices. So, and what we found is that it's actually in those, you know, hearing about Ontario as statewide, you know, 5 million meters, you know, over 60 utilities, um, nothing about service class there, meaning that it's open to all service classes. There's actually a social equity component to Green Button um, uh, Connect and, and, and capabilities, that it's, it's really democratizing access to data 
for all customers, regardless of their background and customer class and rate class that they find themselves in. And it's, it's definitely a big theme of what we're doing um, with Good Rewards, as we'll describe. And, and another valuable point, it, it provides a, what we call a clean weapon to combat climate change. You know, we're really providing tools that enable people to reduce carbon. And to get people motivated, it's always good to say, hey, I can earn something from this as well. Quick overview of logical buildings. Uh, we're, again, a, a smart building ESG mobile platform that enables all types of end users, whether they're commercial, industrial, residential, utilize all the value that Green Button Connect unlocks to lower their costs, lower their carbon, and, uh, you know, save money. You know, that's a good thing too. And earn money. Um, our platform has different faces for different use cases. Uh, we started on the commercial side at Smart Kits, really built for building managers of whether they're multifamily buildings or facilities management of commercial industrial buildings. And now we have, for the past year and a half, a consumer facing application called Grid Rewards um, that literally uh, speaks to the meters that you see behind me, which is a virtual picture of a residential meter bank that you'll typically find um, below the deck in a, in a high rise. Uh, Con Ed, uh, you know, multifamily building, as an example. Uh, we also provide a platform for carbon offsets and, and an energy uh, uh, purchase and acquisition with a carbon point of view. Uh, it all dovetails back to Green Button Connect data, as that data is very much uh, valuable in benchmarking setting what the capacity tag of meters are which affects the, the, the rate that one pays, regardless of you're a resident or a commercial entity. The, the, the mobile environment, um, which is ubiquitous, and then you know, in integrating that with meters, which are ubiquitous, uh, now with all these great initiatives of 10 states, uh, some two big states like New York and California have literally unlocked you know, over 10 million, 10 to 20 million meters um, that now enables folks to participate in. Uh, again, we've, we've been out front building on that UI, that UX for the customer. Uh, Grid Rewards is a, an, a mobile application that not only connects one to their data and to view it in a very valuable way, they can see their cost down to the hour. Uh, they can actually like now understand the, the interaction between like turning on their Keurig or their electric oven and seeing how much dollars just went out the door for doing that. Uh, they could also start connecting when there's events on the grid because we're a demand response provider as well, an aggregator that when the grid's in distress, uh, how they could you know, do their part as a grid hero and pre-cool or preheat and be able to reduce their load and earn something for it, not just in lowering their bills or using less, but actually be compensated for their Grid interactive services. Um, the platform actually uh, at SmartKit um, has been chosen by the GSA and the DOE in their GEB proving ground. And also, we just found out about a couple of weeks ago in the uh, DOE's Connected Communities uh, Awards uh, that were grants that were given out to 10 different entities. We were working in counterpart with uh, Open Esco Markets in the Northeast, in the Boston area, New England. Uh, to provide Smart Kit AI as the GEB, the Grid Interactive Efficient Building Platform for uh, that DOE initiative. So really excited about that as well. A little more deep view of Grid Rewards. Everyone could go to the App Store, download it, um, go to Google Play too, see what it looks like, see the screens. If you happen to be in uh, the Con Ed territory or Orange and Rockland, soon in California, Texas, and Chicago. Uh, all AMI enabled, um, and and very soon in Ontario when when they're ready, we're we're ready to rock and roll there as well. Uh, is to provide this interface of being part of the capability to be reactive, see your carbon footprint. I mean, on the right hand side, you you see that daily. You can, you can even drill down to the hour. It's very effective in providing signals to end users to modify their behaviors. 
everything we do is voluntary. We're not big brother. We're, they're not like opting into, you know, some type of load control and they're sweating in the middle of the day because they can't control the thermostat. Now, these are all programs where they have a choice. Um, the more they participate, the more carbon they save, the, the lower their cost, and the more money they could accrue by providing a service to the grid. Uh, we, we call this our Hey Marge uh, case study. Marge is a real person. Uh, she allows us to use her first name. She's she's one of uh, you know thousands of Good Rewards users in Con Ed. We just rolled this out, and she had she came forward to us because she was just so amazed how her app is really helping her a lower her cost, uh, b you know she she's really fascinated by the carbon footstep content of of the app, and then c that she even gets a check for, for participating. So, you know, those three components are really valuable for customer engagement, but it's also a great tool for a bigger building to participate in uh, grid services and making a really big impact on reducing the carbon. I mean, just from her activities over the summer, uh, high energy months uh, in New York City, she should reduce her carbon footprint by 50%. Imagine if her, her, her building of 300 units did that. That's a big impact. And so we're really excited that we're seeing these numbers. And uh, obviously, ownership of the building is really uh, you know, impressed by that. And there are actual you know, carbon emission laws in, in, in New York City that fine buildings starting in 2024 if they don't reduce their carbon baseline. So having tools that are gauging a free mobile app, which it literally is, for uh, and you know for a resident or small commercial to download, um, is really valuable um, for the whole community. Uh, Smart AI, a little more deep dive. I mentioned this this uh, climate um, act that became law, the Climate Mobilization Act. In New York City is now local in ninety seven. Other cities are looking at it. Boston just implemented their own version of this, where they're providing baselines for building owners that they're responsible for their whole block and lot and the entire building um, to A, put up a letter grade to shame ownership into uh, decarbonizing and B, financially penalizing them starting in 2024. They're giving them a few years to get in front of it and start you know, upgrading the building's controls and the HVAC systems and using good rewards as, as tools to lower their carbon baseline. A, a use case uh, for a big multifamily building with Smart Kid AI. Uh, we're really excited. This past summer, we were the first to install an indoor uh, battery storage system, lithium ion, in uh, the state of New York uh, for a multifamily building within Con Ed's territory, uh, which might be a first just in general. And what was really exciting is that the, the battery, which is completely automation, it's 100 and close to 150 kW, about a quarter of the building's load uh, was able to not just peak shave like batteries will do and not just provide low carb energy because it's you know charging at night with low carbon resources and discharging during the day high carbon resources and displacing that but it's also there as a resource for demand response and it was a really hot summer in new york this past year summer and you know it got a lot of uh, activity sometimes it was back to back days where the battery had to be there um, to provide a charge. And there's a lot of engineering AI work behind the scenes of the, de the decision logic tree of what it's chasing after the charge. Is it going after the tariff? Is it going after DR? Is it a capacity hour event? A lot of, a lot of interesting uh, you know, logic behind that. And it performed greatly. I mean, the, the head of all response of ESG and, and uh, sustainability at Avalon Bay, literally the largest apartment owner in the United States as a, as a publicly traded company, 30 billion plus company you know, is, is they, they look at this part of their journey in decarbonization, putting in this battery. Now, it, if not for the AMI data, that interval data, we use that data to right size the battery. What's the base load of the building? What's its peak? What's its, what's its duration curve? A lot of these engineering concepts to how to right size that battery and where to put it in the building. That was a really successful uh, integration. It took a lot of stakeholders to do that. NYSERDA, State of New York, Citywide Plains, Con Ed, um, you know, a, a lot of chefs in the kitchen, and we learned a whole lot from that experience as well. 
um, to make it a more you know, uh, effective approach going forward. We think this one's really cool. Um, and we didn't have to even go after it. They, they, they found us, uh, you know, Revel, if you come to the city and it might be in other cities, is, you know, an electrification of mobility. They're one of these mobility electric companies where they have electric scooters um, that they now have, you know, ride share Teslas that they're competing with Lyft and Uber. So if you're in New York City and you want to have an electric car specifically pick you up and take you to your destination, there's a Revel app and a, and a blue Tesla will pick you up and take you there. Now, the issue for, for Revel as a company is that when do I charge these batteries? Well, they have big warehouses and different facilities throughout New York City where they do that and where they're located, they all different have different types of windows of where grid intensity is greatest. And they had no idea. So they realized that they would have an idea when that would happen, which we were, we were able to provide in that guidance and, and show them with the AMI data through Green Button Connect through our Grid Rewards app, uh, they were able to modify their strategy of when they charge their batteries for their scooters or their Teslas and literally, you know, earn money for doing that, lower their cost of, of charge and, uh, you know, provide a, a decarbonized way to get from A to B, which is a really fantastic uh, illustration of what can be done. So our, our, our new effort that we're pushing out there uh, nationally is becoming part of uh, you know, a movement of being a climate community leader. And part of being a climate community leader is galvanizing the folks in your neighborhood. So as building owners and as residents, hey, there's tools there now for you to utilize to effectuate this change. And people talk, what can I do to combat climate change? Well, it first starts with you know, seeing how you're affecting the climate. And Green Button Connect provides you that vision, that data, that you can make intelligent choices of how you're going to, you know, you utilize resources in the environment and be able to be more optimal and therefore lower your carbon contribution and, and make the environment a more clean and healthy space. So on that, I'd like to uh, end the presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. Well, thank, thank you very much, Jeff. Um, we're excited to hear that uh, you're expanding and moving things out to uh, to other states. Much appreciated. Thank you very much for for, for talking with us here. Uh, I also want to introduce London Hydro. Um, Zorn has uh, been working on a number of different projects as well as on uh, on preparing for the the big announcement in Canada and so forth. So, Zorn, if you're on with us, uh, by all means, let me. Uh, Get you started on things. Can you hear me okay? We can, thanks. Awesome, so uh, good afternoon or good morning, everyone. I'm Zoran Stojanovic, I'm Director of Information Systems in London Hydro and have been uh, supporting and working on a Green Button program. Uh, well, it's gonna be over seven years right now. Uh, really proud of this picture in this moment. I um, wanna take this opportunity to con congratulate Usman for his leadership vision and his team as well. There was there were numerous hours that were put into this to come to this point. So what you see here is, well, you can't really see our mayor stealing our candy. Uh, I think uh, Jeremy, that was also uh, caught in the camera. Uh, it's a demonstration of green button, connect my data and what we can do in the smart kitchen and a smart home. So similar what Daniel and, and Jeff just presented, uh, I think this is uh, this is our innovation center in London. Uh, where we on November 1st hosted the ministry and minister for the announcement. So huge milestone and huge congratulations to everybody uh, on this on this achievement. I think it will uh, truly believe it will change our in industry and uh, provide choice to customers. Uh, that being said, I have a question for Don. Um, Don, do you think that your PUC email will accept larger recording? I think we just need to send them this presentation and your case would be case would be completed. Uh, well, well, we'll give it a try. I'll, I'll do it anyways. Um, just going to highlight a few projects, most recent projects that were also showcased in our on our November first uh, uh, announcement and meeting uh, for Green Button. Uh, this is really a, a through demonstration and uh, power of, of Green Button Connect My Data. Uh, proud to say that we've been collaborating with Enbridge. Uh, it's our 
uh, energy uh, uh, natural gas provider in Ontario. Uh, and uh, Green Button has been the foundation of, of, of this, this pilot. So what you see on the screen is really uh, a, a program that's designed to reduce carbon footprint and deliver savings to residential customers through hybrid heat uh, pump and um, uh, interesting news about this one. And actually, I just heard it from Enbridge on Monday. Uh, initially, they were really shy uh, releasing this program and uh, participation that was limited. And uh, the latest and greatest that I heard, they have so many participants in London they want to that they want to go with this program that they're having trouble with supply because with COVID everything is back ordered right now. So we'll see how they're going to handle that. Hopefully, hopefully that's that's a good news, good problem. Uh, what you see in here is uh, uh, it's a mobile app that uh, uses Green Button Connect to provide through uh, cross utility experience. So for our London hot customers, you'll be able to see uh, the impact of a hybrid heat pump, uh, your electricity, water and gas built all in one. And most importantly, what's your part? What, what is your household doing to contribute to that uh, pillar that Sad mentioned environment? And uh, it's it's all done through the through the Trickle mobile app that's uh, part of the London Hydro's Green Button Connect uh, offering. Enbridge is our uh, partner in this and uh, really, really excited that we're gonna see Enbridge uh, with Green Button Connect My Data implemented soon. And therefore that this will be enabled for, essentially the data platform will be enabled for the entire Ontario. Uh, along uh, with this use case, uh, uh, we've, uh, London Hydro has been on the, on the green button journey for many, many years from 2014 on uh, participating in, in, in the development and, uh, and the growth of the standard. And this is another use case that our commercial app is providing for property management company. They have multiple facilities. Usman mentioned over 70 utilities that includes gas, of course, uh, in Ontario that uh, this particular uh, customer was not able to collect data and provide value to the customer. So with the mandate and uh, implementation of Green Button in Ontario, these dotted lines that are currently being uh, uh, transferred into Green Button through the, through the London Hydro system, they'll actually become a solid lines and directly sourced from utilities once the Green Button is implemented. So for this use case, over hundreds of facilities across Ontario are being, using, uh, being used for uh, energy and water reporting, and it's all powered with the Connect My Data, uh, the Green Button solution and APIs. A uh, little bit more understanding of uh, and the view, vision of, of uh, what uh, London Hydro has been working on, and hopefully, hopefully, uh, we, we have been practicing on our uh, live streaming from the Innovation Center in London, but hopefully, we'll have a chance to, to host people and our, our industry friends uh, sometime soon. That's our hope. Uh, in the meantime, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll arrange the, the streaming and hosting uh, through the digital media. But this is one of the highlights as well that we, that we showcased this Monday. It's really what we've been able to accomplish and demonstrate and goes back uh, to Don as well for, for, for his email and the feedback to the PUC. Uh, from the day one, and Usma mentioned smart meters, it wasn't originally in the use case for when Ontario rolled the meters, but we've been on, on our journey, we've been able to incorporate any data segment, any time series data, whether it's that from a Zigbee device, from the sub meter, lately from EV chargers, from the heat pump, what I just mentioned with Enbridge and smart homes. All of the data is hosted on the green button platform. And on the top, what you can see is really the use cases and the functionality that our applications are providing from helping digital utility make smarter decisions, uh, third-party innovations. Uh, I'm gonna talk about that a little bit, little bit later, uh, providing data visibility, transparency, that's the key. Data aggregations, we've been working with our local uh, university. Uh, I really wanna take this opportunity to acknowledge Western as well. Uh, over 40 students have been um, have, have gone through our innovation center, and I believe, so you'll have to correct me, but four of them we have hired. And that's also another non-tangible benefit of, of the Green Button Connect and what, what, what this enabled us to, to accomplish in this short period of time. 
Uh, on the right side, sorry, Jeremy, just to go back on the right side, if you can go slide back, you can see our utility collaborating partners that uh, we have implemented connect my data platform and customer engagement solutions. Some of them are in progress. So really, really happy and uh, to announce that that's growing and uh, it's it's really, really proud to announce the utilities in Ontario looking to collaborate and share share the knowledge and resources and uh, especially green button is is it's definitely a use case that that supports that that aspect now on that note um i do want to go to the next slide and also want to answer uh, i think jeff you just mentioned you're ready for ontario well ontario is partially ready for you too so uh, I want to announce that we just recently uh, registered uh, big energy data it's a green button Green, a Green Button Alliance member, but also a third party solution provider. Uh, they have been successfully tested and registered with our platform and they're available on the, on the Connect My Data uh, as, a, as a solution for our customers. Uh, and then going back, uh, we, I would like to use this opportunity for any third party provider uh, to reach out and uh, we'll be more than happy to, to uh, proceed with the registration, not only with London Hydro, but any platform that we currently hosting and maintaining for our partnering utilities. Uh, with that being said, uh, I would I would open the, the podium for big energy data. Uh, thank you, Zorin. Now, real quick, um, I think we've sort of seen a lot. I think Jeff and Daniel hit on a lot of things. And, and Don, one of the, the great things that I think Don hit on earlier was, what's the value of the data um, to be seen, the unknown. And I think uh, Jeff showed a little bit of this with some of the, the carbon and, and renewables. And for here at us at Big Data, we see this. We see a lot of companies coming and asking, hey, can you help us operationalize like, the caption, the transformation of this data? And, and for us, Green Button is, is critical. It definitely makes it a lot easier, uh, faster, more efficient for companies there. It allows them to get to scale. And that's really what you wanna see as you get to scale you see more innovation that's, that's driven, uh, you get lower cost. Uh, and so we're, we're really excited to be a part of the, the Green Button uh, family uh, with everybody on this call and, and uh, more hopefully to, to join, but to see all the different um, ideas and all the different value creation is, is pretty exciting and hopefully it helps uh, with the, um, the approach going forward. And if you look at this next slide, one of the things you'll see here uh, from a, Prescriptive to, to innovative, the more you, you get this data, the, the more you understand this data, the more value you can generate. Uh, and what you'll see here real quickly is, I think Jeff even spoke to some of this, 80% of, of a person's time is spent usually cleaning and get, gathering the data and not as much is spent analyzing. And when you can analyze the things you can create, and, and that's what we see at, on the big data side. When we help companies uh, capture that data, they're able to innovate and drive more value. So just wanted to, to wrap up there. Zorin, thank you. And, and Jeremy, uh, thanks for the leadership there. Thank you, Jay. And and uh, for those who may have jumped on late, Jay is, uh, Jay's been with us on the board of directors. Uh, now, uh, this is his first year. He's gonna be going into the next year, serving a two year term uh, that he was elected to. Uh, and uh, he is, he is full of ideas. He's the one who's brought the ESG concept to the board to uh, to push this forward for us, and we're uh, we're thrilled that uh, we get another year with him on the board. Uh, thank you, Jay. Appreciate it. Welcome, uh, Syed. I want to toss it over the fence to you now to uh, tell uh, tell everyone what we're going to be doing. To look ahead again, real green button depends on you. I mean, it's a fact that we're looking for more members. We want to really we're on a journey. And we want to look at uh, showcasing uh, where we can do what we're going on as far as uh, next year is concerned. I just want to uh, thank everyone. I noticed uh, I responded to a chat, so I've invited everybody for lunch. So I think I've got 40 of you that I owe lunch. The only hitch is you have to come to London. So if you're in London, we'll, we'll get you lunch or next time you meet. Again, thank you everyone for, for their contribution and uh, stay tuned. I think we're going to be having some uh, the next all members call will be on December 7th and 23rd. Thanks very much for your time and, and, and look forward to uh, 2022.